Welcome back to the channel, Flats Class YouTube fans. Today, we're going to talk about the six most common mistakes that I see inshore anglers make. Now, you're probably not guilty of every one of these, and I'm going to take my own inventory. Even I fall prey to one of these bad habits from time to time. But if you focus on eliminating these six mistakes, I promise you, your game is going to be elevated. So we're going to go back to the boat barn and we're going to talk about it. Come on, let's go for a walk. So six mistakes that are fairly common and they typically happen to the angler that's throwing artificials. So I'd say probably number one is the resistance to adapt to change. Now the one constant in fishing is change. Things are changing all throughout the day, the light levels, uh, sometimes, in most cases, the tide height, unless you live in one of those zones where you have very little movement in the littoral zone. Uh, you'll also see that you'll have changes in wind. Um, oftentimes, like you can see today, I'm dressed for it. Uh, yesterday, the air temperature was 80-something degrees. This morning, the air temperature was just a little above 50 degrees. Uh, with a high that's going to probably barely make 70 uh, with lots of north wind. So that's going to drop water temperatures. What does all these changes do, and you know they're coming, to fish? Well, they change the mood of the fish. Maybe, maybe some of the changes make them more aggressive. Maybe some of them move where they are. And then maybe some of them shut them down completely. But if you're the type of angler that is unwilling to figure that out, you're gonna struggle. Uh, we struggle on these changes because you get into a rhythm where you've been catching fish and then there's a change. When the change happens, all of a sudden, you become clueless. You're just not catching fish. And that's when you really have to be a little bit more methodical, a little bit more uh, analytical, slow yourself down and start thinking, okay, big change in water temperature. Fish are probably gonna do this, especially early. What might that be? Might be moved to deeper water, more insulating depth. And then later in the day, maybe move up skinny in a lee shoreline where they can sun and warm up. Um, maybe it's a light level thing, which would alter your choice of lures or colors. So that's probably the number one mistake. So what I'm saying is if you're that guy or that lady angler that, hey, I throw this every time I go fishing and it's all I throw and I fish this zone and this is what I do, and you're resistant to adapting to change, you're going to struggle with artificial lures and you're gonna struggle more often than you're gonna be successful. And that frustration is gonna lead you to do something else, whether you remain fishing or you go back and start fishing more natural bait presentations that might be a little bit more forgiving. But if you really want to elevate your artificial game, you have to master adapting to change. That is the number one mistake. Number two, very much related to that, and it's this. Number two, and how it really relates to number one. This mistake is something I see 80% of the time because I'm an everyday waterman and I'm on the water many of those days with clients and I, and I observe. Too many of us work the bait much too fast, much too spastically, if you will. We don't allow the lure to catch the fish. What do I mean by that? So if you are in and out of the strike zone, let's just say the strike zone is 10 feet and you're snapping and reeling and snapping and reeling all at the same time, you're in and out of that 10 feet so fast, I mean so fast, that you miss fish that you normally would have caught. 
you have to slow yourself down. You have to visualize what the bait looks like underwater. Now, you might have to do that by sacrificing some fishing hours and understanding by watching your bait in shallow water, clear shallow water, how it moves with certain rod twitches and certain handle turns so that you can slow yourself down. Or maybe you're fortunate enough to have a swimming pool if you live in Florida, most people do. You can test the lures in the pool themselves to see how they really swim. But typically, if you give the rod the movement and use less of the reel, you will find the perfect cadence for that lure to spend enough time in the strike zone to catch fish. Many times I'll have a client cast to a zone and I want it to sit for a second or four before we start moving it. Because there are, uh, I can give you inst dozens and dozens of instances in a day where when the lure lands into a zone, it creates a signature on the surface of the water and a sound, and then it falls to the bottom. And then you start working. That two, three, four, five seconds that that's going on, if there was a fish five or six yards away, he may move toward that zone looking, what, what's going on, I'm curious. And then all of a sudden your bait starts moving, he thinks it's trying to escape, he's on it. Now I do realize there are times when you're throwing in real thin water or you're in a structure situation where you have to get it in there and then you have to get it out so it doesn't get snagged up if you're fishing over oyster or something like that. There are going to be exceptions to the rule. But I'd say that number two factor of fishing too fast is what hurts most of us uh, with artificial lures. It just simply does. Um, we either fish a paddle tail too fast, we fish a spoon too fast, we fish a jerk shad too spastically. There are certain species that like those type of presentations. But most of you that are trying to catch speckled trout, flounder, redfish, uh, for those of you in warmer climates, you know, where you can catch snook and tarpon, it, it's not always necessary to work the bait fast. There, there's more of a, a medium, uh, or I'm going to say a middle road cadence that's going to be much more effective. And in many cases, as we said in mistake number one, where the water temperature is going to chill or you got a high barometer, that slower presentation, very slow, is going to work better. Number three now. Now, number three is a common mistake that many anglers fall into. And, and even I myself have, especially early on in my career, would fall, fall prey to this, this, I guess, fallacy that there is a silver bullet lure that catches everything. Uh, in many cases, I was always looking for that lure of versatility, like a gold spoon a uh, white bucktail. Uh, many of you these days have fallen in love with soft bait, so for, for so many of you, it could be a three or four inch paddle tail. Well, when you, when you get locked into a particular style lure or a particular color, for instance, might be, might be pearl white, might be, might be root beer, and you're unwilling to change, you, you become resistant to change. It's like, hey, this is my confidence stuff, man, this always works. That can be a huge hindrance on your success. And, and I find that when I'm going through someone else's tackle bag, you can see what those, those confidence baits are, what they want to throw all the time. Like in many cases, I'll give you a perfect instance. I love throwing mirrodines, and I find that mirrodines work a good portion of the year. But when we get into the really cooler months and it gets pretty cold, I'm not using mirrodines the way I use them in the springtime or summer or even early fall. I find that I'm using fewer mirrodines when I get into these cooler months. So I'm gonna give you a success formula that has always worked for me. I preach it at every public seminar that I do. And that is the number one factor that will make you successful with artificial lures and keep you from making this mistake is lure speed, which is what we kind of talked about in problem number two.
It's lure speed. The cadence, the speed of the lure, is the most important thing that you can master or figure out. That is the first number in the combination to unlock in the code. Number two is figuring out the size of the bait or the profile that the fish really want. Some cases it's a minnow profile, sometimes it's a crustacean profile, sometimes it's something neutral like just basically a Tootsie Roll profile that you can do a lot with, like stick bait. But it's got to be the right size. So if the fish are tuned into two and a half and three inch baits and you're throwing something that's five or six inches long, it's kind of hard to get them to do it, even if you've got the speed right. So lure speed, lure size and profile, one, two. The color is actually number three. But if you talk to many pros and many guides and many avid anglers, they put color way up there. Sometimes it's their number one choice because they're always trying to mimic uh, the forage species or they're picking it based off light levels or water, uh, water clarity. But for me, if I can get that lure speed right and I can get the size right, the shading of that color, especially for inshore, not so much for the bass guys, but for inshore, it really does make the biggest difference. Bet you're wondering what number four is. I'm about to tell you right now. Number four, biggest mistake for artificial anglers, I'm gonna just say, is you, you just lock in to your history spots too much. Uh, you just do. I, I think everyone's guilty of this. Uh, if you were to go up there and power up my Raymarine right now, you would see, especially in my home waters, you'd probably see like 250 waypoints. And there's this feeling when you're on the water that you want to run, you know, based off your location of launch, you want to run to those waypoints and check those first because they've always seemed to be, you know, glory holes, if you will. Um, but here's the thing, unless you put an awful lot of detail in the description of that waypoint on that machine, you really don't know when it was good. You may have named it kind of a cute name um, redfish Cove or something like that. But were the redfish in there in October, November, or were they in there in March and April? Cause that's going to make a difference. Were they in there when the water temperature was 76 degrees or were they in there when the water temperature was 60 degrees? All that makes a difference. So if you fish your, and, and some of us can even say this, I've got like three or four spots. I always launch out of the same marina or I always launch out of the same um, county park. And you always fish those, those zones. It's hard for those zones to be on fire every time you go. It, in fact, I'm gonna tell you, it's impossible for them to be on fire every time you go. You almost, in your head, have to think, okay, let's analyze, again, what the adaption of the conditions are right now what we should be doing first without trying to run to one of our history spots because if you fish history and you do not fish what the conditions are giving you right now you're probably going to fail because you're going to be on the wrong shoreline you're going to be in the wrong zone now where i live here on the nature coast these fish can change greatly um, in just three or four days based off wind and tide height and water temperature. If it gets cold, they like to move closer to a bigger river that goes further east and they like to go as far east as they can because they live on the west coast of Florida to stay warmer. You get three, four days of warm weather where you get 80 degree days again, they'll go from the backs of these far reaching creeks, they'll be halfway out or all the way out. If you don't know that, and you have a waypoint or your favorite spot happens to be Redfish Cove in its way in the back, well then you're fishing in a zone that doesn't even have any fish anymore. So that's why you have to resist the temptation of always fishing your favorite three or four or half dozen spots and try new water. Fish the conditions. Fish the conditions and be aware what you're seeing around you. Are you seeing the bait? Because if you understand where the bait is, 
you're probably going to find the fish. So the lesson here is, as an artificial angler, make sure that you're adapting to conditions and you're understanding what they're, they're zoned in on this time of year. And pay less attention to these history spots that have served you well in the past. Because they're only good for so long and then those spots change. And I can tell you that because I've been fishing my entire life and I'm 50 odd years old now. There are places I used to fish when I was in my 20s, 30s, and even early 40s that there's not even a fish there anymore. So those history spots don't always hold up over time. Always, always try new stuff. Adapt. Stay awake. Don't be so stubborn that you, you or so crutch-like that you have to go back to the same glory spots each and every time. Because if you do, every once in a while, one of those are going to pay off. But most of the time, I'm going to tell you right now, they're not. Let's go to number five. Number five, most common mistakes by inshore anglers that I see, and, and basically inshore anglers in general, is we tend to fish the same general structure all the time. And what do I mean by that? Okay, for instance, you get into a group of islands somewhere and we all want to fish you know, maybe the lee side of the island or the points or the coves we're always fishing a shoreline or oh i know where a nice oyster reef is that sticks out of the water at mid tide and any of these visible or even docks for instance you might see a, a a really nice set of docks that are on an intercoastal you know where you have some deeper water you always see boats there that should be your number one clue because the other anglers know that those are good spots too because they're obvious. These are obvious spots. They've been looking at them on Google Earth or, or, or they've seen other anglers there. There's no better pattern than the bent rod pattern. But by beating on those same spots all the time, it, they're not a secret. They're just not a secret. So if you see my boat there, see Bob's boat there, Tom's boat there, Sally's boat there, Paula's kayak there, we all know, hey, you know, those zones get fished a lot. Are there fish there? Yes, but those fish are going to be a little bit more pressured. They're going to be a little more aware of noise and things like that because they've been fished before. Pressured. What I like to try to get across to my audience most of the time is you need to find the structure that is not as obvious so it's not going to be that oyster bar sticking out of the water it's going to be something submerged maybe some rocks that are deeper down that you happen to see on a really good day they might be a little deeper too they, instead of being in two or three feet of water where you're used to fishing maybe they're in four to six feet of water mm, now we're talking also, fishing some of the further off the bank stuff. So if you get into a small bay somewhere and everyone's on shorelines, you will you might notice that there is an osprey um, keddling above some mullet out in the middle of that flat where there might be a bar or something like that out there. Or maybe you see two or three brown pelicans floating out there because they're hanging around making shallow dives on small anchovy baits. You should go out there and, and check that stuff out because lots of times there is kind of a drain that comes out of a cove or a flat or something like that that's just a little bit deeper. And when the tide first starts moving in or out, those fish are in those zones or they'll end up in those zones. Those are places that don't get fished as often. So you can work, you know, a deeper running bait through there or, or a jig or anything like that. Or maybe... In, in, in many cases, you're just prospecting a good full cast and a half off the exact shoreline that everyone's fishing. And maybe it's still just two feet deep out there, but the fish will get on scattered oyster or maybe they'll be in potholes. The idea is not to, to get into a rhythm where you're doing the same thing. And it's like, wow, we beat 10 miles of shoreline today and we caught four fish. It's, it's what I call, let's keep them honest and throw one to the outside like every other cast. And you'd be surprised 
how many times you will catch your best fish off the bank fishing. I'm telling you, it works even in shallow water fishing. All right, the last one. And this one is a, is a pretty overlooked one, but I think you're going to find it valuable. And that's number six. Number six. It is definitely pointed at, at the angler who throws artificial lures. And that's the belief that there is an all-purpose, all-around rod that does everything. There is not. That's a unicorn rod. We've had videos on that before, and I'm guilty of actually doing videos about all-around setups. The all-around setup, though, is based is is really based off the fact that I want you to throw a group of lures that that rods you know really swings well. When we're talking about you know, groups promoting, hey, this rod throws everything. You'll be able to throw a top water. You'll be able to throw an eight-ounce bonefish jig. That, that's impossible. It's impossible. You're not going to be able to A, throw it very far, and B, be accurate. The rod to lure balance is super, super important in, in inshore fishing. Uh, it, it, it allows you to make the bait land softer, or it allows you to be able to drive a bait and get the casting distance and accuracy you deserve. So the rod that I might throw a top dog, junior, top dog itself, duke dog on is going to be much different than the rod that I'm going to throw a lightweight bugs jig or an MR14, a mini dean, something like that, or maybe uh, a quarter ounce spoon from, from Aqua Dream. Those are going to be much different rods. So when you pick up a rod, you'll know instantly what it's designed to do. You tie a top water on it and that tip starts to bounce a lot and it's kind of healing over at rest, you know that that rod is too light to really cast that top water plug. Same goes for when you put a quarter ounce spoon on a rod and it doesn't move at all and you gotta really drive it to get it to go anywhere and then it doesn't go exactly where you wanted it to because you had to do this exaggerated rod motion to generate enough speed to get it out there, you know that rod is too stiff. The action is too crisp for it. So that's where it's important to understand that rod to lure balance. And I think a lot, a lot of the game in the boat or on the kayak or waiting on the flat is trying to make a rod do something it's not comfortable doing. And then you can't get the most out of your lure. You can't work the lure properly. You can't cast it where it's supposed to go. And, and then in some cases you have a poor fighting tool. So it is a negative. And that's a mistake that I see a lot with artificial lures. So really watch some of the videos that we do when we talk about rod to lure balance. You know, if you've got a rod, for instance, that's a quarter ounce to three quarter ounce on the lure range, I'm already going to tell you that probably the best lures you're gonna throw with that are gonna weigh exactly three eighths to half ounce because that's gonna be the sweet spot for that rod. It's gonna be right in the middle. Um, it might throw some quarter ounce baits well that are specially head weighted and it might throw some of the three quarter ounce baits that I'm gonna say aren't as bulky better, but it won't throw a wide range like, like you would think when you look at that rod. And trust me when I tell you this, I know this to be a fact. There are many rod manufacturers that just put on a, a lure weight on there just because they think it's gonna be popular with you to try to get the largest number of anglers to buy it. Absolutely, when you're in the store, feel the rod. Those crisper ones are gonna work better for the heavier lures and those ones that are a lot more forgiving are gonna work better for the lighter lures. You just use that as a barometer you're going to eliminate that mistake for sure. All right, that's all I've got for you on this particular episode of Flats Class YouTube. If you like what you're seeing, hit that notification bell so that you get the very next episode of Flats Class YouTube. Give us the thumbs up because the more we trend, the better we do with our subscribers. And subscribe, tell your friends, share this. Comment below so that I can answer some of your questions. All right, thank you for your time. I'll see you on the next one.